It's a Farm Friday. Let's talk Oakland A's. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked On MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer and podcaster, and thank you for making this your first listen every single day. And on this Friday, this Farm Friday, as we like to do, we're going to talk about an entire minor league system, top to bottom to top, uh, touch on the top prospects, and kind of give you an idea of who's deep in this system. And let's uh, for the Oakland A's. Starting off in Stockton, the low A Stockton ports. The first guy you start off with is catcher Daniel Susak. Uh, so first rounder out of Arizona, number three prospect in the system. Spent about 27 combined games in the minors. Two games in rookie ball and they were like, yeah, you're good. And he went on to low A. But 298, 354, 404 was the slash line. One home run. Nine extra base hits, seven walks to 25 strikeouts in 25 games. So right there at that one strikeout per game mark. And the thing here with Daniel Susak is defensively, I mean, he's an average defender. He's got a plus arm and he's got good athleticism. Like he played quarterback in high school. And so if they want to keep him at catcher, they probably could. I, you know... I think he can get to average as far as major league defense, which is kind of surprising. He has a like a what is it six four like a bigger frame. So for he's a taller guy. Those tall catchers don't historically do well behind the plate. But uh, I do think he has the athleticism, and then given the catching depth in this system, which we're going to get to, don't worry. Uh, I feel like there's a good possibility that they try him somewhere else. And if they do try him somewhere else, I mean, again, with the with the athleticism, with the arm strength, you could I could see him playing something like maybe a third base or an outfield position. Obviously, first is an option, but I feel like the arm is kind of wasted there. Get him somewhere where the arm is useful, right field, a third base, something like that. But anyway, offensively, this is what you're what you've got him for. Uh, Pac-12, you know. What was it? 2022, 367, 432, 598 in the Pac-12. 12 12 home runs, 19 doubles. Thing here is, he hits the ball hard. He hits the ball in the air. And so, you have a chance to, to get plus power out of him. Now, a lot of his college home runs were pull side things. But I do think that they have the ability to kind of uh, work get him to work more of the field, right? Get him to work more all fields versus just pulling the ball in the air. Um, You know, 6'4", does have longer arms, kind of has those long lever issues that you see a lot where it's just a lot of moving parts to get the bat into the zone for you. Uh, had strikeout rates 18%, 15% in, in college, Obviously, you see he struck out once a game in this, you know, 27-game sample. But, you know, and and to compound that is he chases. And I feel like the chasing is, is out of the zone on breaking stuff. So some of that you can teach, but some of that is going to be just that's kind of the player that he is. It's kind of weird to have a 350 career batting average in college and be considered just average or above average hitter versus like a plus hitter. But I think the swing and miss and the chase is kind of where they're doing that. Uh, he does very well against fastballs. Um, Velo that's 93 and up, he handles particularly well. Again, it's it's swing and miss on breaking stuff. I'm sorry, swing and miss on off-speed stuff and chasing breaking stuff. So want to see him work on that a bit, but... You know, do love what I see out of Daniel Susak and think he can be a key for this team for a while. Uh, another guy here in low A Stockton, number 10 prospect in the system, right hand pitcher Gunnar Hogland. So 6'4, 220 out of Old Miss, 
was actually drafted by Toronto in the first round of 2021, was moved from Toronto to Oakland in the Matt Chapman deal. So a lot of these guys you'll notice came into the system via trade, uh, but recovering from Tommy John. So he lost, he lost 2021 to Tommy John, only came back and threw in like three games this year. So the stat line's not even really worth talking about. I think he got a grand total of eight innings over three games. But before he got hurt, fastball sat mid-90s. He had an above-average slider, an above-average changeup to go with it. But the selling point here was like plus-plus control. Could put any of those pitches exactly where he wanted them. You know, could could leave the slider uh, down and away in the zone for a strike or could drop it a little farther out to make you chase it, could throw the change up to both sides of the plate, could dot the fastball on any corner that he wanted. Um, his strikeout rate in the SEC at Old Miss was like 39%. I mean, if he comes back and the arm, the stuff is the same and the control is there, you're absolutely looking at a number three just based off of pitch ability and control alone. Obviously, the big question is, is that going to happen or not, given the fact that it was Tommy John? Uh, we see this quite a bit where guys come back from Tommy John and the stuff isn't quite the same, and or it just takes them a while to get back into the groove that they were in. But Gunnar Hogland, great tools, good piece. I understand why Oakland went out to get him. Let's just see how he comes back from that stuff now. The high A Lansing Lugnuts in Lansing, Michigan. Max Muncy. The infielder, number six prospect in the system, has the exact same name and birthday as the Dodgers guy, yet they're not related at all. It's kind of weird. But anyway, so 2021 first rounder out of high school, played 123 games between low A and high A. Two-thirds low A, one-third high A this year. 229, 336, 422. 19 home runs, 50 extra base hits. 69 walks to 169 strikeouts and was 19 of 25 on stolen bases. So offensively, he's above average. I feel like he's a little bit of a streaky hitter though because he does this thing where his upper halves and lower halves kind of get out of sync. And so he'll kind of lose the the rhythm to the swing, right? And whenever that happens, he ends up, you know, strikeouts become an issue. I mean, you saw 123 games, 169 strikeouts. A lot of those came in bunches. But when he's on, when his form is correct, um, he is an above, like I said, above average hitter. Just kind of one of those above average across the board. Everything is 55 grade for the most part, with the exception of defense. I think he's average at short. I don't know if he'll stick there long term. It's kind of a 50 50 thing just based off of his size. Uh, how he, he continues to mature, and you know, does he move to third? Does he move to second? I don't quite know. Uh, in just a minute, I want to get to Double A and Triple A. This is where the real talent in the system is. Uh, very excited to bring you some of what they have here. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Bet Online. We are. Most of the way through the National League and American League Division Series. Not most of the way. As I'm recording this, we've played two games between Braves and the Phillies. They have been fantastic. Uh, we've also seen the, the Dodgers and Padres play two games. That series is tied. And then obviously the American League stuff. They all play. Uh, they're actually, I think they're playing right now while I'm recording this. But if you want to keep up with the MLB playoffs or... College football, professional football, all of that. Bet Online has the latest player developments, team matchups, news, and in depth articles and analysis on every game you can find. Live betting, up to the minute scores. It's not just baseball and football. They've got uh, MMA, they've got boxing, they've got golf. So, whatever you can think of, Bet Online can keep you up to date. They've got live, like live odds in the game, they've got live odds for the rest of the series based on where they are in a specific game. So head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action because Bet Online is where the game starts. Okay, so the Double A Midland Rockhounds. Really interesting, kind of to see here uh, some of these guys. The first one, number eight prospect right-hand pitcher J.T. Ginn, 
2020 second rounder by the Mets out of Mississippi State. There's something about if a pitcher came out of the state of Mississippi, he's getting traded to Oakland. Uh, But he was moved in the Chris Bassett deal. Uh, Missed some time this year with a forearm strain. But when he was able to pitch, uh, 12 games, 42 and a third innings uh, between... Like mostly in in Double A, he had two rehab games in rookie ball for the forearm strain, but for the most part, it was Double A. And the and the stats here: five ten ERA, one thirty two WHIP. Was really Im- impacted by the injury. He's better than a five thirty two ERA, uh, and his just his Double A ERA was six eleven. So it was even worse when you take out those two rookie league rehab starts. 46 strikeouts to 14 walks in 42 innings with three home runs allowed. So almost 10 strikeouts per nine, just under three walks per nine. I don't think statistically what he did this year is a proper representative sample of what JT Ginn can do. So he's got a two-seamer that he throws in the mid-90s, but it's not his best pitch. The best pitch is the slider. I think the slider was for, for the Mets was one of the best pitches in their entire system. Uh, and the, his control is very good. And so he's throwing this two-seamer to set up the slider. It's got a ton of vertical break to it. So it has the visual profile a little bit of a curveball sometimes. But the, the fastball, he's using that. It kind of bores in on the hands. Has a lot of sync to it. And again, it's something where he's trying to get it in on you. He sets up extremely far to the first base side of the bag. Or of the uh, of the rubber. And so he works inside on hitters from both sides. So again, that's where the sinker kind of bores in on you. And then he's setting up the slider. And very good about where he puts the slider. He can drop it in the zone for a strike. He can drop it below the zone and make you chase it. He can even occasionally, don't love it, but he can even occasionally throw it high and let it drop down into the top of the zone. Don't love it, but it's something where you may think he just lost his he just lost the pitch, and in reality, he's dropping it in for a strike there. Has a changeup as well. When the changeup, when he's throwing it and he's throwing it well, he gets swings and misses on it. He just has to trust it more. He doesn't like to sort of throw it in some of the situations where you think the sequencing would say, hey, use the change up here, it's going to work. It's average to above average. He just doesn't have the conviction there. So I want to see him do better with that. But overall, JT again, like what I see, needs to be healthy, obviously, in 2022. Uh, I think if he is healthy all year, you could see him debut towards the back half of the year, uh, just kind of based off of, the inherent qualities that he has, assuming that the, the statistics look okay next year when he's healthy again. Number 13 prospect in the system, and another guy just like, uh, again, who's in the Arizona Fall League to make up on time, is Ryan Cusick. 2021 first rounder out of Wake Forest by the Braves, was traded in the Matt Olson deal. Um, missed time this year with an oblique strain. Only got 19 games. 43 innings, 712 ERA, a two whip, 46 strikeouts and 43 innings, so like nine and a half strikeouts per nine, and 30 walks, so like six and a half strikeouts per nine, uh, gave up four home runs. Again, another guy where the stats don't accurately p- paint a correct picture of how good he is. Ryan Cusick is a very good pitcher. Uh, part of the reason he's in the Arizona Fall League. But fastball sits in the upper 90s. He can reach back and get 102 from it. The thing about Ryan Cusick is he's a big boy, like 6'6", 235, 240. Like he's got that size, that downward angle, but can get the fastball, run it up in the upper 90s, and then has uh, a slider. It's above average. It's got vertical break to it, so it's not a sweepy slider, but more of a vertical break. That's what the Braves teach their sliders to be. So he brought that over with him. And then to go with that, Kind of a firm curveball and in a uh, below average changeup. I want to see some improvement on on one of those secondaries, either the the curveball or the changeup. And then the control had been an issue all through college. 
He looked a little bit better last year when he was healthy. I think he only walked four guys and he walked like four guys in 16 innings, which isn't awful, but isn't great. Um, but then again, this year coming back from the from the oblique strain, control kind of lost left him again. So in the fall league to make up time, looking to see again, fastball's elite plus plus can hit 102. He's just got to control it better. Uh, but if he does, I think Ryan Cusick's a guy that absolutely can be um, a, a a weapon middle of the rotation. And the reliever risk, worst case scenario, if the control doesn't come around, he's still going to be a, a fireballing reliever out of the pen for you. Probably a, a medium to high leverage, maybe even a setup man. So, AAA Las Vegas Aviators in their fancy ballpark. Uh, they hosted the AAA championship a couple weeks ago. But they've got two top prospects here. Uh, first one, Tyler Soderstrom, number one prospect in the system. 2020 first rounder out of high school. And been splitting time between first base and catching. Uh, him and Kyle McCann have kind of traded off. They both played first. They've both caught. Soderstrom actually caught less than he played first. So I kind of have him as a first base slash catcher versus catcher slash first base. Um, talking to folks in the system, player development guys, things like that, they say they think he's good enough, like you know, he has the ability to be good enough at catcher to play in the big leagues, but he's not going to play over a guy like a Ling Lears or even maybe over a guy like a Susack. And so the big question here with Tyler Soderstrom is do you full-time move him now so that you can get his bat to impact sooner rather than later? Or do you let him continue, continue to develop at catcher and spend more time in the minors. Offensively, bat is good. 267, 324, 501. Uh, would love the on base to be higher, obviously. But 29 home runs, 55 extra base hits, 40 walks to 145 strikeouts. So, struck out a lot. Um, my, I mean, let's be honest. Str- you know, Struck out over once a, once a game. But very much an advanced approach at the plate uh, lefty swing and it is it is a picturesque beautiful swing uh can keep the bat in the zone for a long time very good strike zone recognition especially when it comes to breaking pitches um it's one of those things like the projection here is like a number four number five hitter I mean I could see him if everything comes together, I could see him as a dude that hits 300 and drops 25 bombs a year. I mean, Tyler Sargent was bad as that good. The question is, he's getting better at catcher. He has some promise, but he's never really been a full-time catcher. Didn't catch full-time at high school. Hasn't caught full-time in, uh, in the pros. And so, do you go ahead and say, alright, he's going to be a first baseman or a left fielder. We're going to go ahead and move him now. Or do you let him continue to play catcher part-time and understand it may take two years before you see him at the big league level? That's the trade-off you're looking at here. Is He could be up next year if he's playing a different position. If you're waiting for his catching ability to catch up, you're looking at two years from now. Do you give up a year of him uh, by moving him off of catcher? I think there's a path where he can play first base, he could try him in the outfield, maybe. And then he can be your emergency catcher, your backup catcher, uh, can catch one or two days a week as like a work in progress kind of thing. But knowing that you have Shea Langoliers at the big league level, he's in the next segment. Something where I definitely think, go ahead, get Tyler Schroederstrom's bat up to the big leagues. If the bat doesn't hold up and he needs more seasoning and he goes back down, that's a situation where you can say, okay, in that case, we'll go ahead and we'll give him, we'll let him catch some more and let that catch up. But I think his bat's going to be good enough when he gets up there. Number top, Another top prospect here in AAA, Zach Gelliff, 2021 sixth rounder out of Virginia, actually in the fall league right now as well, 6'3", 205, but got 96 games in this year. And what he did with these 96 games, it was, most of them were double A. He was a September call up to Las Vegas. But what he did in these games, 
270, 352, 463, 18 home runs, 37 extra base hits, 50 walks to 121 strikeouts, and 10 of 12 on stolen bases. So struck out more than, significantly more than once a game. Don't love that. Walked 50 times though. So not terrible. You don't necessarily hate that. And I don't know if defensively he's going to stick at shortstop, right? I think there's a there's a possibility, it's a toss-up right now, whether he ends up moving um, to third base. He had an elbow injury in college, and his throw mechanics are a little weird because of it. The arm is kind of average. When he's on the run, like picking and throwing, it, wor- it looks fine. But when he kind of sets his feet and he's using correct mechanics, kind of throwing over the top, he struggles. Uh, I think his speed is good enough. And his athleticism is there where you could put him in a corner outfield spot. You'd be fine. I'd probably put him in left over right. But you could absolutely do it. Offensively, I feel like this is where you're, you you kind of know exactly what you have to work on here. Um, he's got power to all fields. He, pull, he pulled it a little too much in college. Can hit to all fields and the power's definitely coming in. Um Average exit velo is something like is something in the 90s. I mean, kid can bang. Uh, does very well against fastballs. Can hit velo. Struggles against breaking pitches. And so, work to do still. I think that he's probably going to go back to AAA. This is the second straight year that he's gotten a small look in AAA at the end of the minor league season. He went from low A to AAA last year. Double A to Triple A this year. I think he'll open back up in Triple A, and I could see a scenario where they keep him for two thirds of the year, call him up late. I could see a scenario where he tears it up and he's up at midseason. I could see a scenario where he's there all year. Just kind of depends on him and how he develops. In just a minute, I want to get to the prospects that were called up to the MLB level and are playing in Oakland. And making an impact right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. And we're back. So when we're looking at some of the, the prospects that got called up to Oakland. Obviously, I am I would say a lost year for Oakland. But it feels like every year has been a lost year for Oakland recently. But uh, very much. So Shay Langoliers is the first guy that I think of. Got 40 games in Oakland after spending 90-something in Las Vegas after the trade from the Braves in the Matt Olson deal. Uh, quick reminder, 2019 first rounder out of Baylor is where uh, Shea Langleyers came from. And up front, fantastic de- defender. Uh, has an absolute cannon. Great with game calling. Pitchers love throwing to Shea Langleyers. Could use a little bit of work as far as blocking goes. But for the you know and 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 some some framing work, but for the most part, very good, uh, very good arm, very good defense. So no concerns there. Best defensive catcher in the system. Nobody's going to catch over him from a strictly defensive standpoint. Offensively, so in that forty games, two eighteen, two sixty one, four thirty, six home runs, seventeen extra base hits. Nine walks to 53 strikeouts. Now, he walked more in AAA. In 92 games, he walked 43 times and struck out 88. So this is definitely an adjustment to the big leagues. The biggest jump, you'll remember, is to AA. The second biggest jump is the bigs. Sometimes it's the other way around. It just depends on your schedule and who you play. The two biggest jumps are to AA and to the bigs. Flash the power, right? We know the on-base can be better. You know, his, he was in the 300s in every level of the minor leagues. Uh, the big thing here is he's got some holes in his swing that he needs to work on. Um, elevated fastballs, and again, we've talked about this on the show a ton, how that is a weapon right now in MLB. The elevated fastball can get him, and then sliders away can get him. Where, he, you know, he sees it, he, he wants to go for it, and then he ends up chasing out of the zone. So, Shea Langoliers... Absolutely the catcher of the future for the Oakland Athletics. Just a matter of you have to stop chasing so much. Number five prospect in the system, Ken Waldachuk. 2019 fifth rounder by the Yankees. Uh, He was moved in one of the deadline deals where the Yankees were trying to get relievers and trying to get pitchers. So Trevino, I think, was the deal where where Waldachuk came over. 
but they called him up seven games at the big league level. 34 and two-thirds innings, a 4.93 ERA with a 1-2-1 whip. 33 strikeouts in 34 innings to 10 walks. So eight and a half strikeouts per nine, two and a half, 2.6 walks per nine. Uh, gave up five home runs in those 34 innings, which is, you know, fine, I guess. I mean, it's not ideal, but it's not awful. It's not, not, it's not the end of the world. The thing with Ken Waldachuk is doesn't have a true out pitch. He's a back of the rotation guy because he doesn't have that pitch he can throw when he's got to get a dude out. His whole thing is it looks funky. He's got deception. It comes in kind of funky and just messes with you. So he's got a four seamer in the mid 90s. It's great velocity for a lefty. Four seamer in the mid 90s. He can touch 98 with it. And then to go along with that, uh, slider, curveball, they kind of blend together. Uh, and and so it's hard sometimes to differentiate them for him. And so he throws one, it looks like the other, needs some improvement there. Uh, Changeup is kind of, I'd say, probably average, maybe, maybe above average. Um, I like the slider down in the zone. I... I like the curveball's velocity difference from the slider. I just need one of them to take a different profile. Maybe he can learn that that Yankee-style sweepy slider. Maybe they traded them because he couldn't learn it. I don't know. Um, but yeah, very funky delivery. He doesn't always repeat it well because it's so funky. And so what I think he needs to do is he needs to learn, needs to con- improve command and control. And then needs to learn um, to repeat the delivery and learn like an like an out pitch. Learn this is I think the changeup could be that pitch if he can get it to be a little more consistent and a little more movement to it. Um, if he does that, he can be a back of the rotation starter and eat innings. If he can't, he's probably going to end up being a reliever, like a lefty specialist reliever. You've got. You know, their lineup has lefty, righty, lefty at two, three, and four, and it's the seventh inning. You call Waldachuk in, you let him go to against those three batters, the lefty, the righty, the lefty, and then he comes, and then you, hopefully the inning's over, but, but either way, you pull him. Um, so a lot of variability in the projection here. I absolutely think he can contribute at the big league level. It's just a matter of we need you to figure out that out pitch. Uh, last guy I want to bring up real quick, not rated in the system, no more prospect eligibility. Christian Pache was the other big part of the Matt Olson deal with Atlanta, the outfielder. Uh, at one point in time, was the number one prospect for Atlanta, fell out of that. 91 MLB games for Christian Pache across multiple stretches because he went down to Las Vegas and came back up and went down and came back up. 166, 218, 241. I think at this point it is safe to say Christian Pache offensively does not have it. Uh, he'll probably have a job for a while because he's fast and he's a fantastic defense. Probably have a job as a defensive specialist on teams for a while. But 91 games, 3 home runs, 10 extra base hits, 15 walks to 70 strikeouts. I mean, I don't really know what to say. Uh, the offense is just not there for Christian Pache. And and at this point, I don't know if it ever will now. He's got 115 games in the bigs. So he's got two-thirds of a season. And his career big league slash line is 156, 205, 234. I don't know if it's ever going to come in at this point. They're not going to give up on him, obviously. He's a very good defender. Um, he'll be, you know, He's very fast. He can be somebody who, you know, pinch runs, defensive replacement, that kind of thing. But... Uh, at this point, I don't see him as a as an everyday regular anywhere. Two teams have given him a shot. It hasn't worked out other place. Fantastic week this week. This is a long show. Sorry about that. Um, excited to come back to you Monday. If you have questions for the show for our Monday mailbag, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Show is on Twitter at Locked On Farm. Or you can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com. Enjoy the playoff games over the weekend. And until we talk on Monday, this has been Locked On MLB Prospects. Mm-hmm.